Christ. Who are you? He said, trying to think of something to say that might get him out of this. We're your friends, said a voice he recognized as Coral's. We're your friends, and we want to know why you don't introduce us to your new buddy. Savin found that he had some difficulty swallowing. You want to meet him? Sure. I mean, he's just a guy. You'd like him. Why don't we... Shut up, said Coral. And at the same time, someone pushed Savin. He said, Coral? Look, shut up, repeated Coral. He was pushed again, this time so hard that he fell over. His fall was cause for more laughter. He wondered who else was there. He thought uncomfortably about how big Lan was. He thought about trying to run then, but one of the three was bound to catch him, and it would probably make it worse if he tried to run. He stood up slowly, trying to think of something to do, and not succeeding. Coral called him a name and waited. Savin didn't do anything. He was sent sprawling once more, and once more he got up. He thought about charging them, but he couldn't make himself do it. Some part of him kept hoping that they'd be satisfied just to push him around a bit, although he knew the hope was vain. Then the boy next to Coral called him another name, and Savin recognized Lan's voice. He guessed the third to be Lan's brother, Tommy, and this was confirmed in a moment. Savin stood and waited, feeling as if none of this could really be happening. Someone pushed him yet again, then someone else pushed him, and this continued for a dizzying time until he fell to the ground again. He wondered what would happen if he just lay there, and decided they'd probably kick him. He stood up slowly, wondering in a distant way if they could see him well enough to hit him. Then someone punched him in the stomach, knocking the wind out of him and doubling him over. Answers that question, he thought, beginning to feel as if he were somewhere else. Here, let me, said Lan, and sat and waited. Her mate was trying to tell her there was a problem, and she didn't understand what he meant. Well, she understood the part about there being a problem, but not what it was. She tried to tell her mate this, and he in turn got confused. They wheeled about in the sky. After a time, he managed to convey what he wanted, if not why he, or rather the provider, wanted it done. She didn't have any real objection, but she didn't understand how they were to tell one of them from the others. Her mate seemed to think that this didn't matter, that things would work out anyway. This was somewhat puzzling, but she trusted him. He led her through the sky below the overcast. On the ground, a gray wildcat prowled the night, leaving her nest briefly unattended. She called her mate's attention to this, but he insisted that this other matter, whatever it was, should be attended to first. They came to a place, and through the darkness she became aware of a group of animals, much like the provider himself, huddled together as if in a herd. They circled, and after a time, it began to look as if one was being singled out by the others, either to be driven off, or to be mated with, or for some other reason. Was that the one? She wondered. No, all of the others. Very well then. Now. Now. They flew down together. She felt her wings cup the air, and she was suddenly very close to one of them, his face white and ugly in front of her. And, her mate insisted in her mind, they were not to bite. How could she not bite? How? Very well, she would do her best for him. She hissed and veered away, looking for another. But the others were already running away. Would her mate allow pursuit? Yes, he would allow pursuit. A little, at any rate. She set off after them. When her mate thought they had frightened them enough, she pulled up, swirled around her lover, held her breath, and they climbed above the overcast once more, taken again by the sudden beauty of the countless stars. They danced there for a while, laughing together, then turned to where the provider waited for them with, her mate told her, his thanks. Just his thanks? Wasn't there something tasty to go along with his thanks? Of course. Wasn't there always?
hate. I will not marry a guzzling drinker. I will not marry a guzzling drinker. He'd be no lover and no thinker. Heidi, Heidi, hola. Step on out. Savin stepped into the house, shutting the chill out behind him. The fire on the hearth had died down to coals, but the stove was still giving off heat. It seemed very safe, but he didn't feel any sense of relief. This was strange, and it occurred to him that he hadn't felt frightened. That he hadn't felt much of anything. Where have you been? said May, in a dim, distracted sort of way, as if she expected a reasonable answer and would be satisfied with almost anything. Even while Savin was wondering what to say, he heard his own voice explaining, A minstrel showed up at Tem's house, so I stopped and listened to her. Oh, that's nice, May said. Perhaps tomorrow, after the harvest is done, we'll all go together. Was she good? Yes, May, said Savin, wondering how he was managing to answer. Well, go to bed now. Your sister's already asleep and we have a big day tomorrow. I will, May. Pei listened to this mild interrogation with abstracted interest and made no comment. There is much that I do not understand, thought Savin, looking at May and Pei. Everything has changed somehow, and nothing makes sense anymore. Why don't I care? What is happening to them? What is happening to me? Savin found his place next to Paul Yi, who was already asleep. He got into his night clothes and crawled in among the furs, warmed by the low fire in the stove. It was starting to get chilly at night. Funny he hadn't noticed it earlier this evening. Or maybe not. He'd been occupied with... with other things. He lay back and stared at the ceiling, his thoughts running in circles like mating Salmoth. A reasonable answer and would be satisfied with almost anything. Even while Savin was wondering what to say, he heard his own voice explaining, A minstrel showed up at Tem's house, so I stopped and listened to her. 8. I will not marry a guzzling drinker. I will not marry a guzzling drinker. He'd be no lover and no thinker. Heidi, Heidi, hola. Step on out. Savin stepped into the house, shutting the chill out behind him. The fire on the hearth had died down to coals, but the stove was still giving off heat. It seemed very safe, but he didn't feel any sense of relief. This was strange, and it occurred to him that he hadn't felt frightened. That he hadn't felt much of anything. Where have you been? said May, in a dim, distracted sort of way as if she expected a reasonable answer and would be satisfied with almost anything. Even while Savin was wondering what to say, he heard his own voice explaining, A minstrel showed up at Tem's house, so I stopped and listened to her. Oh, that's nice, May said. Perhaps tomorrow, after the harvest is done, we'll all go together. Was she good? Yes, May, said Savin, wondering how he was managing to answer. Well, go to bed now. Your sister's already asleep and we have a big day tomorrow. I will, May. Pei listened to this mild interrogation with abstracted interest and made no comment. There is much that I do not understand, thought Savin, looking at May and Pei. Everything has changed somehow, and nothing makes sense anymore. Why don't I care? What is happening to them? What is happening to me? Savin found his place next to Paul Yi, who was already asleep. He got into his night clothes and crawled in among the furs, warmed by the low fire in the stove. It was starting to get chilly at night. Funny he hadn't noticed it earlier this evening. Or maybe not. He'd been occupied with... with other things. He lay back and stared at the ceiling, his thoughts running in circles like mating Salmoth. Tomorrow morning would see the end of the harvest. Then would come the festival. Then would come... what? He didn't want to stay in Small Cliff anymore. 
But the idea of leaving was idea of leaving was dim, impossible, unreal. As unreal as the experience outside the house. As unreal as those things he'd learned from the Easterner. As unreal as what had happened that night. He was caught between leaving and staying, but the choice was somewhere off in the distance. The idea of the morning was also dim, impossible and unreal, and the day that was ending could not have happened. Maybe it was a dream. He'd have to tell Coral about it. Coral. The Jereg. The same ones? Vlad. What do you do when nothing makes sense? Stare at the ceiling and watch it dissolve into wavy lines and wonder if your future is engraved therein. Savin slept, and if he dreamed, he had no memory of it. The next thing he knew, it had become morning, and with the morning came the familiar sounds of everyone stirring around and the smell of the tea that Pei, always the first one up, brewed fresh for the family every morning. Savin's arms were stiff and sore. He had fallen asleep with them locked behind his head. He made fists and shook his arms, then stared at his hands as if they were not part of him. He remembered that Vlad had looked in the same way at his maimed hand. Everything had an odd, ethereal feel, as if time had become disconnected. Savin stood outside the house and realized that he didn't remember breaking his fast, yet he felt the warmth of the bread in his stomach. Later he stood behind Paul Yi, holding a sack, and didn't remember getting there, nor how the sack had become so full. Pei was in the bins, already beginning to seed and strip the plants, preparing to send them off to town, while Mei was counting and weighing the sacks in order to make the account. So Savin and Paul Yi were alone in the field. Occasionally Paul Yi would say something, and Savin would realize a little later that he had answered, but he had no memory of the conversation. They finished the harvest, and he hardly noticed. Paul Yi cut the last plant. Savin put it in the half-full sack, tied it and hauled it into pay. There had been no need for such caution. It hadn't rained. But then, if they'd neglected to store everything in the bin, it probably would have. Was that really true? Was anything really true? Savin set the sack next to the full ones. He felt Polly standing behind him. Pei looked at the sack and gave Savin a smile which he felt himself responding to.